and your ability to, to uh, bring together some really interesting people and to explore where, where we were at and where we are going. You were talking, I think, the other day about serendipity. And as it turned out that day, we had had a local speaker who had to go go to her funeral and uh, the late Alan Weinkrantz came up to me and said, hey, I've got Jeff Pulver here. Do you want to talk to him? Yes, yeah, so it it, it's magical, right? The, the, the unplanned moments of magic that we don't always recognize while they're happening, but we're appreciative because they did. And as I recall, um, 10 years ago, because of the interest that we were just showing in the video uh, that you've always had, through ham radio and communication, and I had it when I was a kid with Citizens Band Radio, the, 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 the desire to reach out and connect with people, you became early on very interested in Twitter, didn't you? you? Uh, I, well, I, I, I have to give a slight update and say that in 2020, by the way, I'm very knee deep back in amateur radio. Uh, I discovered uh, some of the technology that evolved is actually the same tech that NASA is using for interstellar space communication, which I find Fascinating, but yes, uh, in 2000, and I guess I started using Twitter 2007. What I discovered about Twitter, it was it created a back channel, so that for the first time in the in the era of my using the internet, there was a way for anyone's voice to be discovered, to be heard, and and that could actually change the world. And I that was really after the Haitian earthquake, the way that uh, the world came together to provide um, safety and. Um, access to medicine and, med and, and medical advice, medical support and so many things. And it, it was a back channel. So Twitter to me, you know, is, a, is still, is still a, it's an interesting platform now. It's commercialized as AI and so many other things, but it, it offered for the very first time for, for one person's voice to be amplified where it didn't matter where you were in the world that you could be noticed and you could be heard. And uh, that I found special. That combined with the back channel that if you were if you are on television and you're an anchor and you're listening to a hashtag that while you're at commercial break, you could actually listen to what your you, what your viewers have to say. And some people were taking that into consideration when they were live. And so it was really a really fascinating way to look at real the evolution of real-time communication. It's also interesting to me that in that era, 2009, 2010, this was the era of the uprisings in the Middle East and the use of social media to uh, try to get the word out. Fast forward 10 years later, and as we heard in the last panel, uh, the kids of TikTok were advancing the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I think there's no going away from the reality that people will use the technology platforms available to affect positive change. And that it, as we go forward in time, it's going to be the reuse of some platform that will be used in a constructive manner that maybe it was never the intended purpose. But, you know, we, we, we all some people can do is create technology, how it's used and how it makes how it becomes known is up to the people who, who apply it. I mean, that's what I love about creativity. That's what I love about making good mistakes. Some of the basic uh, things we take for granted are in day to day lives. Someone else stumbled upon while they're looking to do something else. And when you look at the, the, uh, how, how communication evolves, there's no surprise that today it's TikTok. And tomorrow, you know, it will be the platform that resonates with the people who are need to share a message. And uh, you know, what we do know is we cannot stop voices from being amplified. And we can, and we can be predictive and understand that, that as technology evolves and as the internet grows in, in, in connectivity, that we will be more connected tomorrow than ever before. And it's up to us to figure out what to do with that enhanced connectivity. As someone who has an FCC order named after <laughs> him, the Pulver Order, as you mentioned in that video, um, keeping regulation at bay, what concerns do you have about the current environment we're in where the president through executive order, through his administration, uh, is is uh, trying to ban uh, a Chinese-owned uh, social media company? Um, my, my experience working with Washington is there's a lot of rhetoric and very little action. And uh, I, I will tell you that back in, 19, in the year uh, 1999, leading into 2000, 
there was a lot of noise about it, something called HR 1462. It was a, it was the first time it looked like commerce was being recognized on the internet. And I actually held uh, the first ever internet freedom rally on the steps of the US Capitol. I did that in the year 2000 and the year 2001. The first year, a few hundred people came. The second year, thousands of people came. I unfortunately picked like the hottest day of June, both years to have the rally. And I, and I couldn't, and I was trying to stand up for the, um, for the netizens, for everyone who would be affected by legislation being created by people who wanted to keep things the same. It was the first sign there was disruption on the horizon. But what I discovered after years of going to Washington, trying to protect the future, is a lot of time, it's rhetoric. It is, it is true. There are bills that are in the House. There are bills that are in the Senate. But what takes action is very uh, just a small percentage of it. And it's usually it's the thread of the success of what's going to happen that moves the world. So back in, the, back in 1996, it was the threat of the success of Internet telephony that moved, the, moved Washington, D.C. to negotiate and renegotiate tariffs with our 50 largest trading partners to effectively drop the cost of long distance calls almost to nothing. Because there was a lot of taxation in place. I mean, grow, growing up, we, you know, if you called you know, from Chicago to, um, I mean, even to the suburbs, you, you would actually run into trouble. Forget about going out of state because of all sorts of fees and stuff. And you go across national borders and it's a whole tax structure for payments. And uh, that was all renegotiated in 96 due to the threat of what could happen wasn't what had happened back then. These days, of course, everything is IP. But in terms of going to Washington, yes, we have to be, we have to be ready to fight at any notice, to stand up for what may be wrong, and to share our voice. We should never be afraid to speak our truth. We should never be afraid to have an opportunity to stand up and, and, and share who you are, um, even if what you're doing may be misunderstood. Um, so in terms of where is it going, uh, what, what was fascinating to me, and I only found this out a few years ago, um, when I sat down with the executives of Verizon, it turns out due to the Pulver order in 2004, Verizon changed its entire branding strategy and corporate strategy to be a data company. If you look at their acquisition since the Pulver order from buying Yahoo to buying this and AOL and so many other businesses, they're in the data business. And they decided too to do data, that they are not a telecom service provider, that they are in the data business. So, so what I found fascinating is when I showed up at a meeting at Verizon and the, uh, I don't know, number four, number five person in the company, I walk in the door and the person says, congratulations, Jeff, you won. And I didn't know what he was referring to. Then he explained to me that it was the effects of the pulver order that changed everything that the Verizon did. And if I didn't believe him, I should just look at what Verizon's corporate strategy was from February, 2004 forward. Um, that said, we're always going to have to worry about innovation not coming through. How do we service the people who don't have access to capital, who need communications the most? I've been working on some, I won't call it startups, but I've been working on some research projects uh, um, on my own for the past couple of years on how to enable, it was actually ironically under emergency conditions, but how to deliver uh, emergency communications without being, without being reliant on cell phones or internet. And uh, it turns out that amateur radio and some technologies around ham radio have answers. And they actually could even provide connectivity to areas that are not, um, that are in rural areas so that it's they're not, you know, you don't, you have broadband in most places, but some places there's large gaps. And how do you provide connectivity to people who need it the most? So I've been researching and experimenting and maybe one day we'll announce a uh, an initiative to help serve those people because uh you know, we have to be cognizant of what's happening there is the chatter inside the beltway versus outside the beltway um, but i will tell you that anyone who's hearing me talk that nothing is impossible what i didn't really appreciate back in 2003 when i woke up with a premonition that i should take action is how difficult or challenging it is to actually see an opportunity, get clarity, and then have a law come out. Like it's impossible. It doesn't, you know, in retrospect, there's most people were shaking their heads like this guy's crazy. And I didn't know I couldn't do it, which is why by and large it happened, because if we don't know something is possible, anything becomes possible. And and so I I will not we can't stay uh, you know calm. Whenever there's a threat to communication, if there's rhetoric about a law being passed, uh, we have to take it seriously. 
we have to be aware and be cautious and understand the implications. Uh, pick our fights, maybe, because maybe we can't go to the mattress every day. But, but certainly, if if there's a call to action, that we need to speak our voices up. And and I learned so far that the power of one is much more powerful than power of none. And that even if you want to, you know, you want to uh, get a group of people to take action, you usually need one person first to take the lead. And uh, so I don't take communication policy lightly. And uh, I, I do worry about, you know, providing, you know, access so that in the future, future, maybe we can get away from all these tariffs that kept uh, the communication industry at bay in America for a hundred year plus years, and maybe create competition. I mean, we have from Elon Musk, you know, he's creating broadband connectivity in, 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 the, in the sky. Um, actually, since I've seen you, I've actually taken on a passion of the night sky and I travel, well, when I could travel, I, I became an astrophotographer. I photographed the Milky Way and you know, having those satellites pop up in the dark skies where I went to is pretty obnoxious because it takes away the magic of that essence of being with you one with the universe when you see all these blinking lights coming across when you're not otherwise seeing airplanes. So we need to deal with light pollution. Light pollution to me is that something which is really a flip of a switch, which really shouldn't be an issue. But there are some people who were not challenged or there were no regulations about light pollution when putting up satellites in space. So some people accidentally or intentionally took advantage of that. Um, but I, I do think there's an entire business of, if you will, of being the communication provider to low earth, or low earth orbiting objects, whether it's satellites, uh, future um, stations in space, who's gonna be the ISP to the moon, who's providing connectivity to Mars, who's providing connectivity you know, in between our, in our solar system. I mean, it's uh, one thing for Vince Cerf, I think back in 96, to come up with an IP matrix for each of our planets and to create domains where we have IP everywhere, literally. But there's actually a really big business in providing that connectivity and uh, it's, it's valuable stuff. And, and so um, I, I don't take anything for granted. And I, I, I do worry about um, noise and rhetoric and action and being blindsided. I, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's ever an excuse for being blindsided by communication law. We have to take every, uh, we have to be aware <laughs> and um, at, at least hope that, that if something bad happens from a legal perspective, from a law, from, that we can find a way to reverse it so that, because we always want to be inspiring entrepreneurs to, to change the future, to be positively disruptive. It, it, it is to the, it is to the better, better, better of all people that we create an environment where there are greenfield opportunities so people can dream so that people have a reason to, to, to try things out, to explore and then create, and then make a really good mistake in creating what they thought they were doing. And that may change the world. So we, we want to always keep that cold drum of opportunity in front of us and, and, and not put in policies that take away in a desire to innovate that we don't want to do. So, so anytime there's any type of noise or action, that takes away the entrepreneurial spirit from being able to be a positive disruptor. That's an issue for me and, and many, many other people besides myself need to know, but be aware so that we can continue to encourage people to be a disruptor and to innovate for our future collectively. I spent a lot of time studying broadcast regulation and, and at different points, it has been very protectionist in a way against innovation and disruption. And, you know, as we've seen with the newspaper industry, um, that kind of insulation isn't really healthy in the long term in terms of competition, is it? Well, in fact, what happens is the entire industry gets disrupted because they not they can't even move forward. I mean, the 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 uh, the newspaper, I actually advocated uh, had to be 10 years ago, or more when people were maybe, I guess maybe 15 years ago, when people started talking about the death of the newspaper, which was uh, way ahead of time because the newspapers, some, some today still thrive. But I suggested to this one newspaper in California that they should forget about charging money for their advertising. They should get actually into the flow and getting a percentage commission for things that, that sold through. So that rather than having a, a classified ad or a display ad, I actually make that the place where the transaction takes place and they get a commission for anything that's sold through their, through their platform, they should make money. And everybody thought that was stupid. 
So, but I, I do think that to the extent that you have a community and you're able to enable commerce through that community, then why not get a percentage of the, of the pie if you're the facilitator for the commerce that's taking place? And, and, if, and, and if that's too much friction, then, then the market will figure out where the fair friction is. So you can isolate, um, you can create all sorts of uh, uh, platforms that protect, but then people innovate around. So, so there is uh, a lot of stuff protecting broadcast TV, but out of nowhere, you know, it wasn't really out of nowhere, but, but what about Netflix, right? What about all these other platforms on broadband where now people actually don't need uh, broadcast TV to get access to the information because they're living disconnected, if you will. I had a, I had a startup I did in 2005 called Network 2. Network 2 originally, its intention was to create a directory of episodic long tail internet TV shows. Funny enough, in 2020, I'm actually now hosting or co-hosting several internet TV shows back once again. But Network 2 was, I was, that was the first time I looked at YouTube and I came up with 38, 36 or 38 different categories of shows. And these were all individual creators creating shows. Uh, content was not the best in all cases, production quality, not perfect, but it was a foreshadowing for a lot of the TV shows that you now see on Netflix and not just Netflix, but Hulu and every other platform from Apple TV on down because everybody wants to be a creator. And if you have access to the studios to create high-end production value products, you will. And all of that is disruptive, if you will, to broadcast TV. So that if you completely isolate broadcast TV and make it so so hard to penetrate, then we'll, we'll, we'll just look at the noun in Webster's Dictionary and redefine it. And, and we'll redefine how we, what we do and we work around it. And so, you know, same thing also for access to content on cable TV. It will take many, many acts of Congress to liberate some of the content that's so ingrained inside of how cable is because the way that things were licensed uh, in the past, I'm not saying going forward, but in the past, there was a concept of the regionality of content, just like with music. It's like if you were a fan, the fan of the Beatles, you know, the Beatles were issuing in, in 1963, there were a lot of Beatles music being heard in England that wasn't being heard in America. And for the longest time, there was this, this uh, allocation of uh, where in the world the music gets licensed, where in the world does a con you know, television content get licensed. And, and then once cable started happening, there was never really cable specific content or broadcast specific content. And then you had all the syndication issues. Then you had all the licensing issues. If you had music on that show, what region of the world actually can have that music in it? Where is it licensed? And it, it's all the digital rights, which you know, is still not so right and, and needs to be figured out so that we can freely create and compete all, you know, with even keel uh, playing fields, uh, isolation, Tech, um, policies, unfortunately, will have the unintended consequence of dis disrupting and disintermediating the media, the media or the medium, uh, depending upon context. So we got to be careful. I, I appreciate why we protect, but we don't. This is not a case of protect and serve. If you protect too much, you may actually protect the, the, that industry out of a business, and enable by its action a whole cottage industry to prosper, prosper because of it. So there's, there, there, there's ups and downs to it. Uh, I, I do think today, once again, we're suffering from way, way, way too much content. Um, not a bad thing, um, but it, it's, 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 uh, when we get overloaded with content, what do we do? We start going back to stuff that we know we love. And uh, you know, the, one of the benefits of a pandemic very well might be is that you get to find content you never otherwise would have explored, but you're curious what to watch now and what your friends are watching. And you start to, you know, what you start falling in love with content that could never be cleared for broadcast TV because there are too many curses in the dialogue and because of this, because of that, yet you love this stuff. And now it's like you have, you have effectively disconnected from the, from broadcast television and you're living just off the internet. And uh, you're, that's, that's actually not a you know bad thing. It's just a different thing. And so, how do you service those consumers? What's that ecosystem look like? Uh, is Apple TV the future of television? Is it, you know, where, where does that all go? Um, and and, and it, it, it's really licensing. It's really who, it, and, and many people don't understand that ABC Studios could be producing the Jerry show that shows on, on CBS networks. That, that people think that, oh, it's CBS, so it has to be from CBS Studios, but no, it's actually, you know, things are produced in one place 
and shown on another network. It's also when things go into syndication, it's like, how come, how come uh, Jeopardy shows up on ABC channels in, in New York City, but in, uh, but in uh, I don't know, in, in Austin, Texas, it's on NBC. And it's, you know, there's so many misunderstandings that you need to be a lawyer to better understand how content gets distributed. Um, so anyway, it's a very long way of saying that too much protecting it, protectionism could be harmful to what you're trying to protect. Yeah, if I might play devil's advocate, we were talking earlier today about this behemoth, Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, et cetera. And the concerns that people have from an antitrust side of, of the picture. And, uh, you know, the fact fact of the, of the power now that is wielded by um, Facebook Inc. Any concern uh, about that? And if so, what do we do about it? Yes. And there's no antitrust. I don't trust at all. There, there, there's, the, there's no anti here. I do not trust. I was one of the first people to speak about breaking up, a, breaking up Facebook. If you, um, I'm not a scholar in the AT&T breakup of 1984, but I, I believe at the time that AT&T was uh, deemed to be uh, anti, uh, to deem needed to be broken up. They had maybe 500 million uh, lines that they were serving. They had 100 million uh, customers, uh, and uh, you know it was not in the scale of Facebook, which is serving over two billion people. You know the the uh, monopolistic power of Facebook today. If you combine it with how many people are on Messenger and, and, and WhatsApp, it's 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 you know nobody in Washington. Um, seem to have had the guts to take on some, an obvious elephant in the room, so to speak. Uh, you know, if at and was an antitrust and had to be, need the Clayton uh, Sherman Act and everything to basically create competition, you know, you need to break up Facebook almost on a on a state by state basis. Forget about country basis; that it's it's actually too powerful. Also, uh, for all the love in the world that Facebook may have given us in the beginning, because we can discover loved ones who we grew up with and lost romances. There's never been such an amplification of hate. There's never been such an amplification of bad things. And uh, under no circumstances can I ever, ever, ever forgive them for allowing Cambridge Analytica to thrive on other people's uh, emotions. And that's just, that, that is a crime against humanity if there ever was one relative to the social media world. And that of itself, you know, should be a takedown. It, you know, it, it, again, Facebook showed that there's an opportunity for community to exist. Uh, where Facebook failed is in the artificial intelligence. If you keep things on a human level, can empower heart-based communication, so there's positive energy, and we'll call it love, where we, we set the intention to do no harm and to do good things, you can create a great environment. I, I would encourage anyone who wants a living example of that to check out what I've been doing because I've actually been hosting um, online on Tuesday nights, East Coast and Thursday mornings, East Coast, gatherings of like-minded people where our intention is just to help people connect in a world when we otherwise can't find friends. And that at works, you know, for me, Facebook first took a, a da first, if you will, jump the shark. Um, the moment they moved away from real-time experiences to using AI, to figure out when I should actually see what Jerry did. Because there was a time on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram particularly, where actually if you posted a photo, I would see it in real time. And, and I would actually be in that moment. I mean, I ran a conference, the 140 conference tagline was the state of now. I very much believe being in the moment, being in the flow of life. And so if I'm walking down the beach and one of the magical moments on Twitter I had in the early days was I was walking down the beach, taking a photograph of a sunset and and a few and I and I searched sunsets or, or sunrise and sunrises and I found someone literally I think it was in Indonesia who was doing a sunrise, and we were on the other sides of the world. We had the only thing we had in common is that I was doing sunset, they were doing sunrise, but we were in real time, and that to me like gave me the first preview of the power of what it's like to be connected in the world, and when these companies took that away, so they could sell my data to uh, monetize it, to uh, exhibit, to uh, advertisers and everybody else, it took away a lot of my heart. And it took away a lot of the soul of what Facebook represented to me. So in terms of um, do no harm, uh, Facebook does a lot of harm. 
Facebook um, can be trusted only as far as you could throw it, but how could you throw Facebook? You know, on the other hand, they, it brings love. I, I, I cannot deny the amount of positive energy collectively that Facebook has brought me and my friends and so many others by being a place to come and hang out, sort of like everyone's version of Cheers, where you have a friendly face. I mean, I, I always say that your Facebook page is like you're the mayor of your neighborhood. If you decide to have, you have a 5,000 person um, a city, you have a 5,000 person city. If you have a 300 person city, you have a 300 person city. You decide who has a voice, you, you decide who want, who's not allowed in, you decide all those rules if you decide to be the mayor of your page, um, because that's sort of what we have, right? And if you have a kingdom, you deal with, uh, the, the non-scalable challenges of that, but the ability to unite hate is much, it had became much stronger than their ability to unite love. And, and, and that is my concern. It, it, it's the fact of uh, how certain people gamify their ecosystem to do bad things. And I'll stay out of politics, but just mention that, you know, to be used by other people and then abuse others in the process, is just not good. And I don't know how that scales because we never had a communication company before that had 2 billion customers with such power and influence, which connected most of the broadband world. So that if you had some algorithms running in there, if you don't need to do a what if science fiction analysis of what the future looks like, just model it on Facebook. And, and, and that's where the crimes start to happen because if you all of a sudden start seeing you know, government regime change due to lies or due to this mistrust or, or whatever, it's very hard to trust. Once you've been once you've been hurt, it's very hard to come back in and and trust something or someone again. So, I happen to be love based. I happen to believe in the spirit of the human experience. I believe that light wins over darkness. But when we're used as tools by someone else just to because they could, I don't tolerate that. And so, you know, I appreciate the magic of integrating Facebook, Instagram, and and. WhatsApp and what it means for so many people around the world to have a place to share their life photos, a share a way to communicate in stream and a way to share their days. I don't take anything away from that. But from a business perspective, I would not bet that Facebook stays 10 years from now, no Facebook. I really hope that I really hope that the will of the people of the world gets together. And you know what, if Facebook won't be torn apart because of uh they're too strong in Washington. They didn't make the Facebook learned from Microsoft that they have to be stronger than Microsoft. So if Facebook is able to somehow obliviate Congress and everyone else from taking real actions against them, I would like to believe in 10 years, there's no need for Facebook because the next generation product will come out while Facebook is still so enamored with itself. It'll forget where to look and uh, it will evolve. As you know, um, the college community, which I guess would be the uh, gen, uh, uh, the millennial community, the millennials of today, generally are not using Facebook. It's 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 more like it went back two generations. So Facebook already lost their core audience uh, from where they were launched. They already lost that. They're not getting that back. So now it's just a matter of who they keep, and, and the way they're going. Um, I believe that other environments will prosper in the future, and Facebook will become the 2020 version of Friendster. You know, the we've seen this in the research visualization uh, more so on Twitter because the data are a little more accessible, but it looks to me as though the algorithms that are being used in this monetization scheme really drive us into polarized political camps, that they are essentially driving us apart rather than bringing us to Because that makes money for them. You know, it, look, the reality is it's like, why do certain comedians, why were certain comedians insult community? You know, it, it, it's a style. It, it, it's not necessarily even the intention, but in Facebook, it, it's, it, it's their intention, right? They, they want to sell more ads against the two parties competing. So they want to create noise. They want to create distraction. They want to create um, a fight when there is no fight, because otherwise, how are they going to sell? How, this, how they convince a campaign to allocate $3 million of campaign funds for advertising if there's nothing to fight against? So they create noise. And uh, uh, there's no doubt about uh, the greed, the greed that's involved and the emotional 
the emotions that are felt by everyone else who's affected by this greed. It's really not good. I mean, despite what Gordon Gecko might say in Wall Street, greed is not good. <laughs> greed is, um, uh, particularly in Facebook's case, and they'll pay the price one day. I'm, I, I, I'm confident that, that there are, are others, alternative social networks already evolving. And um, it, it's not about, Facebook may be already over, but its half-life is probably 10 years. So it'll take a time before uh, it really realizes, wow, we really should have done something else. We should have bought TikTok when it was only $2 billion. Well, whatever it is, it's, it's, and again, that's, you know, how many, comp how many companies from 100 years ago is still relevant today? How many companies, you know, 20 years ago is still relevant today? Some make it, others don't. I mean, ironically, Apple is now like Microsoft and Microsoft is acting like Apple. You know, it's a yin and a yang, right? And so uh, once the founders of those companies were gone, you know, what happens to the future? And uh, I, I am, uh, I, I believe in love and I believe in platforms that amplify love around the world. I'll leave it and, and just say that um, I don't trust Facebook. I, I never did. And I still don't today. In a way, what you describe is that they're behaving a bit like the political parties and the debates. <laughs> they're just amping it up to, just to, uh, to, you know, basically rack in the money. Hey, it'd be nice if the people who are being who are doing debating actually were forced to answer the question that was being asked and didn't choose to answer a question that wasn't asked. I agree. Let's talk about community some more because I think that's really fundamental um, in the research. We've been studying online communities since the 1990s. I know you've been a part of them. Uh, you have something now called the Jeff Pulver Network. Tell us about that. So um, it's a, in some ways a colloquialism, I suppose, but uh, I have a d database that goes back to uh, 1995. And uh, back then it was just pulver.com and I was doing events uh, focused on uh, the, uh, well, I didn't realize it was going to be about the future of communications, but it evolved over time. And um, I guess it was late last year, this year, I started referring to that database as the Jeff Pulver Network, since it wasn't from one company, one event, but it was a co collection of many activities that I've done over the past 25 years. And so um, I have discovered in this pandemic, one of the things that we need to get through this pandemic is community. That it's the companies that embrace community will thrive, not just survive, but thrive. And if you can provide value to your community, the community is there to help you figure things out. And so um, as far back as 2006, I started hosting networking breakfast events around the world. Uh, passion-based, where uh, I would go, I think in 2006 to 2008, I went from Vancouver, British Columbia to Jerusalem. I did uh, 25 breakfasts in 18 cities. And then after 2008, I started doing them in just a few places. And in New York City uh, in 2020, uh, of, of all years, I finally got my act together. I even published a calendar. And I was two months into 2020 when I had to cancel the entire year. And um, well, what I had started doing back in 2016 or so is whenever I host brought people together, I asked them to state their name and something they're passionate about. Not so much what they did, because my own my own life experience was that if I was uh, if I joined a business networking event, I usually had to explain myself in five words or less to a crowd of people who did not know me. And in the room was uh, the generic accountant, generic lawyer a real estate a broker, there was an office supplies person. There were different people who I was a great lead because if I just came into the town and I was opening an office, all these people had services to sell me. But it was a very transactional type of relationship. Now, if I happened to know that the lawyer was a ham radio operator, and if I knew that the uh, accountant was uh, an astrophotographer, and, and this other person shared my passion for comic books, then I would have a relationship with those people to this very moment. But because they were so focused on selling me services that we never got past hello. And after two meetings, I decided to disappear. So I started hosting these events where I don't really, you could talk, if you happen to be passionate about the work you do, okay, great. But besides work, what are you passionate about? What drives you? What gives you? 
And that opened up another side of most people to me that many people actually in the beginning didn't feel so comfortable opening up about. But, but I, I've, I go out of my way to create a safe space where people can be vulnerable, where they can be themselves, if you will. They, they can l- let go of one or two of those facades they put on to pretend to be like everybody else, and they get to be who they are. And, and I, what I have discovered is by bringing people together and providing content, and in my case, repurposing Zoom, I've created uh, so far four uh, internet TV shows, and I've created something which I call a Zula. Uh, Zula in Hebrew or in, Ara- in Arabic is a comfortable place to hang out. And you'd say, why do you need a comfortable place to hang out? There's so many places you can go to hang out. It's true. But as you get older, it's harder and harder to make new friends. And so by, by bringing people together, asking people what they're passionate about, what I've actually been able to do is to create friendships. And because it's 2020, um, I actually have people coming in from Sydney, Australia and sitting in a box right next to somebody from, from London sitting next to a box and someone in Tel Aviv. And there's no delay, there's no lag, and it's in real time. And what I never thought about in the past was the emotional energy that's shared, the intensity of it almost, the, the intimacy. And it's very powerful. And when you're able to bring a community of people together where they can get benefit and value by just being themselves, you are, have a logarithmic opportunity of where that can go. And so I'm actually in the early stages of learning from my five months of running these events. And I actually think I've come across what I believe will be a new a social network of the future, but it's based on the singularity of the people involved and the fact that we all have, we're not AI based, we're people based, it's heart based. I specifically ask people to hold a positive energy space When we go into breakout rooms, I have people I trust to help moderate the meetings. And I always tell people that if you don't feel comfortable, drop out of that breakout and go back to the main room. There'll be someone there to talk to. And I specifically don't talk about politics because politics, I've never seen my mom throw anyone out of a Thanksgiving dinner until the year that people start talking about politics. And so, but I like things like love and music, bring people together. We can go across nationalities and find a common passion for the human existence. We talk about certain things, things that will divide us, I don't touch. And, and what I learned from that is, is the community of people that you bring into your life matters. And that, and that I was, I was, I've been working or coaching or how do you say, communicating with a bunch of businesses. And I think the secret to getting through this pandemic is in engaging your community, giving them things to do. And where's the money? The money will come once you figure out who your community is. And so by having a different variety of shows, first of all, I'm having fun. I earlier today, for example, and it took two months to do, but um, back in August, I was reading stories about the 45th anniversary of Born to Run. And uh, I read a story about this guy, Louis Lahav, who was a young engineer who came into New York from Israel after uh, finishing the army. And now he ended up recording Bruce Springsteen's first two albums and then did Born to Run. And before that, he just randomly happened to have recorded uh, uh, James Taylor, Janice Ian and Blood, Sweat and Tears. Then he gets this, then he records Bruce's first two albums. And then he actually spent six months working with Bruce on the song Born to Run, let alone the album. And uh, it took, um, it it took uh, uh, two months to, to get to the guy who did this. And, uh, I always tell people, if you don't ask, the answer is no. And I'll tell you that every person I asked in the music industry to introduce me to this guy, everyone said no to me. So I went directly to him and he said yes. So because I had him, I I also were able to get, because what happened anyway to this guy's career is after he did Bruce Springsteen, he went back to Israel and he brought the concept of a music producer to Israel, which they never had such a concept of this guy who does music. And for the last 40 years, he's been the guy that's launched the careers of so many famous artist there. And I was just curious from his journey in life, how things went. And so I had a really fun time. I had this guy and David Brozo, who's a very well-known Israeli musician. He came on as a cameo because he was talking to Louis and I had my um, other friends. And it's, it's, for me, it's an outlet of expression and opportunity to connect, to share and engage with people. And, um, 
and to have meaningful conversations where we're just talking, right? We're not selling anything. You know, a lot of TV talk shows, you know, I'm coming on your show, Jerry, because, you know, I have this movie coming out in three weeks and we have to, we have to get some people to start watching it. So I'll come and say hello, but ask people to watch the movie and make sure, or if I'm coming out with an album, I want to do a track so people will buy my stuff. But here I'm having heartfelt conversations with people and that, that the show that I, that I did today is called The Soundtrack because I wanted to, I've, I've been having conversations with people whose life work influenced the soundtrack of my life. And so no one may know who Louis Le Havre is, but everyone seems to know who Bruce Springsteen is. And so, but you know, in order for Bruce Springsteen to be Bruce Springsteen, somebody had to be on the other side of the recording studio glass to make the album, to create, help him create that sound and help him innovate on what he was trying to create and even give him the platform to understand what was possible. Because I think, as, he, as Louis said, uh, Born to Run was made with only a 16 track uh, recorder. So it was a lot of that editing, a lot of editing. And so you learn a lot. So, and, and I've been learning a lot about the people who I connect with, who my friends are, who, where the relationships are. And when a friend brings a friend into the Zulu that I do, it's the most amazing gift. Because my dad taught me that um, uh, an introduction is an endorsement which is why on LinkedIn, I never, ever, ever will introduce two people who I don't, if I don't know either party. So I may have like 30,000 connections on LinkedIn and maybe the first few thousand, I actually are people that I met. And then after a while, I just got tired of saying no, because I know what it's like to be no, no too many times. So I have this ec eclectic list of connections on LinkedIn. But if contact number 7,000 wants to meet contact number 15,000, I just say no, because I don't know the strangers, but if you wanted to meet one of my friends, I would say, of course. Because as my dad would say, an, an, an introduction is an endorsement. So when I'm seeing people from these uh, Zula communities onboarding their own friends, that says everything. And so for me, that's the value comes from the community you connect and the value that those people get from being connected to you. And so we are all our own social networks, right? And before there was COVID, if you, you know, I would have used the same R factor for using, you know, there was a time being a super connector or super spreader was a good thing. There was a time when we could use the network effect and not think about, oh my God, how many people were just um, infected, but really look at how many people were just connected and what, and what small acts we can do that help elevate and raise awareness across, across uh, um, communities. So for me, it, community matters. It's, it's, it's everything. Um, it's anything and everything to me. It, 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 the community is the heart, the soul of who we are, of what we do. Um, and uh, sometimes the hardest part is to recognize what your, who your community is. And it's not so much what you can do for your community or what your community can do for you, but to understand that the real community is there because it's you, not because there's an economic gain from it, but because they're truly are interested in who you are and there's mutual love and mutual support. We're not putting anyone on pedestals. We're there as equals to share, to be there, to connect. And like as a ham radio operator, I know what I've learned is when I traveled around to different places, if I met a fellow ham operator from um, Hutchinson, Kansas, which I did, I was welcomed into his house, even though we met at the local diner because I was a ham radio operator and was immediately in the ham community. And um, that's true when I were, if I were to go to Bermuda, meet another ham operator, same thing. And all of a sudden I'm having dinner with a stranger, but they're not really a stranger because we, we both speak the same language. Or if I meet a photographer, if I meet particularly an astrophotographer, we have, so, so it's, it's the community of people associated with our passions that create opportunities to, for connections. And so if you're a business trying to understand, well, how do I apply all this? Well, it's, it, the reality is it's the humanity that matters. It's the ability for you as a business to shed the anonymous front that you have and let the soul of the owner of the founders or of the company be felt that you're not going to be a monolithic entity, that the companies whose, whose energy can be shared and felt by their customers will be successful. Those companies that have communities where there are actually people there and not just objects they will thrive when we can connect heart to heart, energy to energy. But if we're all we're looking for is transactional based relationships in times of COVID, it's uh, you might as well put out your going out of business sign now, because, because a lot of those things we can do without, it's the noise in our lives. It's the people we, who matter to us that we can feel their presence that we're going to connect with because we have people have time on their hands 
and they're not going to waste, even if they have excess amount of time, which is a commodity, which is unbounded, they will not share it if it's not meaningful. And, and so for me, it's, uh, I, I hired my first community developer in 1999 because I realized when I was doing the Vaughn conferences, I couldn't scale to say hi to everyone who's coming to my conferences. Yet I wanted everyone who came to my conferences to feel like they were welcome and at home. And by then we already had people coming from 40 or 50 different countries. People were traveling from all over the world to spend three days to hang out with us. And so I wanted to share my appreciation and my gratitude for people who came. So the best I could do was to bring other people on board and say, you're a community manager, please say hi to these people for me. And, uh, you know, that was way before social media. We maybe back then we were being social with our media, but it was different than what we, what social media means today. And, uh, I, I do think that it's the community that ultimately will do it. Cause look, if Facebook was serving their community, there would never have been a, a Cambridge Analytica scandal. If Facebook was serving their community, we would not be dealing with fake news or we would not be dealing with all these scandals and all this hate because there would be humans involved who would make decisions. It wouldn't be Skynet taking over the world. It would actually be people. It's just that they got greedy and they decided to take it to, to outperform Wall Street at the price and the sacrifice of everyone in between. So, so to me, if you love your community, you will thrive, not just not, not just live, but you will thrive in times because it's the connectedness of that community that can amplify when you need something amplified, to provide support when you need support and be there when you need just to share their presence. Final question, and then uh, we'll jump to the reception, uh, which is maybe a little bit of a Zula in its own right. <laughs> yes, um, it seems to be. So you did, you did some work with educational communities. Uh, I remember 140 EDU back in around 2012. Yes. Educators obviously are dealing with this pandemic as, as best they can. Um, and, you know, my context on this is I have a granddaughter in Chicago who's starting kindergarten on an iPad. And it's tough, right? It's tough to, yes. to, to have a kindergartner in that experience versus the very, you know, face-to-face -face intimate experiences we expect. Um, what do you say to educators who, uh, who have, you know, had to embrace the technology, uh, had to adapt very quickly in March, and are still dealing with this? Um, where does your optimism come in terms of, of the path forward on the other side of the pandemic? I have one of my sisters happens to be an educator, and a lot of her friends are educators. So I, this is a conversation which is not new to me. Um, part of it is if you want to be futuristic is imagine that we're actually taking a mission to Mars and we have people entering kindergarten. How are you going to teach the kid? Uh, you know, it, you know, if we actually are going out to explore br brave new worlds and civilizations, we actually need a solution for what happens for a long, long, long-term deployment outside of earth on a spaceship, on a spacecraft. And so that's sort of the analogy I can give your granddaughter having kindergarten on an iPad because it is going to be a small group of people and there is going to be a, com um, a communication part that's going to be isolating. It's, I don't think there's a way around that. Also, and I don't want to be political at all, but li I believe all lives matter, right? That, that we don't want to, I don't believe in knowingly putting anyone in harm's way. So it, you know, if there's any risk to, uh, from the custodians, to the professors, to the teachers, to the students, of getting sick or dying because they're on the front line and going to school. I mean, my sister signed up to be an educator. She didn't sign, sign up to knowingly put herself in harm's way. And so I have a great issue with the, the science of how to protect, how, do we even know enough about the secondary effects of if you were to have COVID and you survived it, the scarring that it leaves you and what that means for, you know, for, for the future time on this planet, like how, how prepared are we to handle, it's not just the 210,000 people who have passed away so far, but it's the millions of people that have actually been infected and what happens to them. We don't have enough data yet to even understand that. So to the extent that your granddaughter is protected by being on an iPad, I am thrilled. Now, I, I also believe that she was gonna miss the intimacy of the interactions with other people. And I believe that we all need that social ability to be social and to 
have play dates and to interact with others and to learn to become who we are. And we need the opportunity to grow. There's no replacement of that. So I, I understand that's a, an issue and I don't think there's any replacement of any of that. Um, on the, and the technology is going to evolve, but you know, we, we still don't have those 3D holograms that you saw in Star Wars. We don't have that really fun experience of like being there. We don't have that yet. Um, and then you throw, as you said, back in March, this crazy cocktail of technology with and without broadband, with and without Wi-Fi, with or without enough devices to scale to teach. And by the way, not every parent is a good teacher and not every teacher had a school district that supported their needs, that provided all the PPE. You know, I, life was so much simpler when I didn't know what PPE stood for. And, and, and life was so much simpler when, when I didn't have to think about um, any of that. So. Um, to answer your question, I, I, I believe this is a learning experience and uh, we, we will learn. And there's a possibility in, in, in real life that we will have schools of the future that's, you know, um, somehow a, a mashup between home learning, homeschooling and 100 percent digital schooling. And maybe there will be in a concept that kids get together to be social outside of school. And it might be that in some communities, again, if we're on the Star Trek, we're on the Enterprise and it's, it's, we have to go on deck to learn or go to our cabins to learn. It's a, just, it's a different experience. I mean, there's a pedagogy, a ped, there, there's a way of learning that's been the same for 100 plus years. And there's a movements within the education community, as I'm sure you're aware of, that we need to modernize that so that we deal with the 2020s. And that was way before the pandemic. It's just that people wanted to modernize the, the, the school and modernize the learning experience. You know, back when the 140 EDU was going on, the big fight was, um, do we give our kids mobile phones? Do we ban Facebook or Twitter from school? And all, and all of a sudden, even if the, the school, the, the computers in the school library didn't have Facebook or Twitter, they, the kids had mobile phones. And then got, unfortunately there were school shootings. So parents worried about the safety of their kids. So all of a sudden kids had mobile phones again. And so it became a circular thing about public safety, kid safety, life. And it's like so much chaos. So um, I believe in time, we will understand the best practices on how a school district can best teach their kids and, and how parents can become better teachers, how parents um, could better help their kids learn. And I believe that there's enough software out there that will evolve that will help us all become better learners. And then we'll, we'll understand all that. We're, we're, we were not prepared perhaps to do distance, we know about distance education for a long time. Look at the Vaughn conferences, the Voice and the Ed conferences, which I started. You know, there were certain demographics and co topics we covered from the very beginning. Distance education was one of them. Um, would you believe we also did stuff in medicine? We did, we did all this telemedicine back in, in, in the late 90s. This was not new. You know, the pulver order, to, to my credit, although it was really the work of thousands and thousands and thousands of other people. But the ability for people to freely communicate without having to pay for anything enabled the, the home, everything that we did. Every, most people who benefited from being able to communicate for free because of the pandemic through things like Zoom is because they're relying on what happened with the pulver water for in real life. I mean, it's, you know, it had a tremendous impact in, in how we all communicate around the world. Although I, you know, would have liked to have thought it would have happened this way if I didn't stand up to do it. It, it, it did happen. And so, with education, I am worried about the future. I worry that parents who were relying on their on the teachers for their kids to teach them that that we may miss a, a grade or two until we get into get the right way of doing this. Also, for social distancing at schools, you know, we, all of a sudden, uh, at least where I live, if we want to do it the right way, we need to increase the school budgets by two or three times and get two or three times the amount of school space. So that if you want to social distance schools, all of a sudden you can't have large classes, you have small classes. So you need more space for classes and more, you need more teachers. Um, how do you possibly safety move, if you have school buses, how do you socially distance on school buses and where do you draw the line? And if you can do it the right way, all of a sudden we probably have to have four or five times the budget for education. And that's just on the public side. So there's a lot of noise over there because that reality people want, but no one's really going to fight for it so much. I mean, getting us the library budget in my town passed each year is a fight, let alone increasing it by four or five times. Um, I like to believe that the tech innovation, the way that we've innovated so many other industries 
if we are open to disrupting education in a positive way to create a set of tools that allow kids to learn on their own, to explore, uh, allow teachers to scale what they do to offer one-to-one learning in a one-to-many environment, we can get through this and we can thrive through this. We just have to get there. Uh, and we will not replace physical interactions with others. We need that as humans, I think. I'm not a scientist. I can't definitively say that. But as a human, I would say I miss the social interaction. I, I miss the positive hugs, the embracing of someone to say, I love you, the, the way of just acknowledging this presence of somebody else and, and feeling that. So we don't have any kind of substitutes for that, for the endorphins that go into our, you know, that enter chemicals into our brain because we're feeling good about something and feeling like excited about that. So we miss that. Um, but I, I have faith in the technology needed for education to evolve so that we can come up with a compromise where students and parents um, feel comfortable with where we're at. I will say though, on behalf of all the misfits, Almost everything I learned in my life, I taught myself. And I, live, I grew up in a world without YouTube. I had a chance to build things, to break things, to explode things in a polite way when I did model rockets. And, and I do believe in self-education. I believe in self-learning. I also believe in structure. And I, and I think we need to find a way to support both. I, I want people to be able to comply so that they, they, when they take standardized testing, that they can do well. Um, and have a chance to explore, to find their own passions. Because no matter what, what your age is, you're always passionate about something. And I, I would like to believe that education, and I've seen signs of this, but we need to find a way to be better prepared for 2021.